Hello and welcome to our brand new YouTube series, In Conversation With. I'm Eva Bishop and I am Communications Director for the Climate and Nature charity Beaver Trust. And I'm Sophie Pavel and I coordinate communications with Eva. We are also climate activists and in this special series to acknowledge COP26, we're letting you be a fly on the wall on a chat between two inspirational figures about some of the key topics at COP26. Yes, this is going to be great fun. Bite-sized snippets of insight that won't take up too much of your time, but may well resonate with you. We want this to be something that you can fit easily into your day, but enough to give you some serious food for thought around all that hustle and noise at COP26. So in this series, we and colleagues will be in conversation with experts on each of the four sustainability goals for this landmark conference. From biodiversity to finance, to collaborating on a greener future. We've got some fascinating conversations lined up for you here. So without further ado, welcome to this conversation. So hi, I'm Nikki Saunter and I'm talking today with Ben Goldsmith, which is a treat. And we're going to talk roughly, we're going to talk around the subject of um, the fourth goal of COP26, which is work together to deliver. Small set of words and a pretty mighty challenge as far as I can see. So yeah, hi, hi Ben and how are things with you at the moment? Hi Nikki, thank you very much for, um, for having me. The origin of this is the Beaver Trust. And so I hope we'll have a chance to talk about beavers, which are an obsession of mine. I think the, the, the more you learn about the power that beavers have to breathe life back into our terribly depleted landscapes, the more obsessed you become. So we, 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 we mustn't get through the next 30 minutes without talking about beavers and the need to have beavers back in all of our river catchments. Well, maybe we should just start there. Get, let's let's dive straight in. As a beaver would, like you, I'm similarly obsessed and and... I don't know whether it's the same as the same way that you became obsessed, but I went to um, Chris Jones's wonderful farm in Cornwall and spent a sort of evening and then into the night stumbling around in the increasing darkness with one of those magic uh, red torches that you can see with that uh, and listening out for spotting and finding eventually beavers, which was just super exciting. And, um, and, and being in that landscape that felt a bit like going, to me, it felt like going back in time, actually. It felt really like a land that time forgot. And it gave me a sort of little mini insight into what our world could be like if we collaborated better. You know, we're back to collaboration, collaborated better with the rest of nature. You know, I don't think we're very good at doing that as humans. And when we do do it, it's a joyful, spectacular thing. We could do so much more if we were perhaps a little more humble or a little more appreciative or even intelligent, actually, about what we could gain by, by collaborating. But I'd love to hear your, your story of how you, how did beavers get into your brain? Well, in, until I heard that beavers were back living free on a small number of river catchments in the west of England where I live, I'm embarrassed to admit I hadn't actually known that there were ever beavers in Britain. Mm -hmm. I knew of North American beavers and I knew that they'd been dramatically depleted um, by the fur trade and that they were starting to recover. I didn't even know about European beavers. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, I know that there were once probably four or five hundred million European beavers ranging from Britain down to Spain and all the way as far east even as Mongolia, and that these had been nearly annihilated by people before we even discovered America. Um, they were hunted for the uh, very valuable castoreum oil that they have in their sacks, behind their tail, which keeps their fur waterproof, and of course for their fur itself. Um, and there were probably fewer than four or five thousand remaining in tiny pockets in mainland Europe at the turn of the 19th century. Um, and um, it was Charlie Burrell that told me about beavers and then introduced me to Derek Gow, who even looks a bit like a beaver. Um, so devoted has he been to, uh, to restoring beavers back to Britain and back to our national consciousness. And what Derek has really taught the country is that beavers are one of the most powerful tools we have for breathing life back into the landscape. Because by damming up little streams, little creeks, they create permanent pools of water that quite literally teem with life. And by gardening around these and along the water's edge, they bring in the sunlight, which creates 
um, enormous diversity of wildflowers and fresh growth of aquatic vegetation and so on, and brings light down, which is crucial for the fish that live in the water and so on. And so, like you said, when you first visit one of these beaver made wetlands, you think you've landed in the kind of Elysian fields. You know, it's like a it's like a scene from the from the dark ages, really. These the, 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 the dwellings that they build. You know, the first time I saw one was in Somerset, a huge shield of a thing built out of sticks and carefully plastered with mud overhanging the water. Um, an enormous construction. You know, I wouldn't have been able to build it myself if I'd spent weeks at it with my sons. I guess um, I began to realize that in the process of building these pools um, and, and, and restoring life in the form of these wetlands, beavers also help reduce flooding and help us mitigate some of the practical problems that we're facing in this country. You know, when, 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 the, when the rains deluge in winter, all these little beaver pools will fill with water, um, thereby helping to reduce the flash flooding that affects a whole bunch of towns in Britain almost every winter. Mm -hmm. And then in the summer, um, when we would normally be getting a hosepipe ban after a winter of constant rain, beavers will help to trap water and then that water will leak through the dams and keep the flow of rivers maintained through the summer. So the whole hydrological system of our country, I think, um, can be transformed for the better by beavers. There's a kind of um, collective psychology thing as well. Um, the, the return of beavers has somehow rewilded our national psyche. Mm. You know, this is a story that has attracted a huge amount of attention. I think most people now, if you stop them on the street, you'd find are aware that beavers are back in Britain, that they've returned one way or another, um, that this species has been reintroduced. And I think you know, a, a clamour is now growing as a result of that for a much more ambitious vision when it comes to nature restoration in Britain. The, the, these species reintroductions, storks returning to Sussex and white-tailed eagles coming back to the Isle of Wight, you know, talk of bringing pelicans back to the Norfolk Broads or the Somerset levels. You know, these, these are totemic visions, which I think um, you know, raise the ambition and get people excited about restoring what is really a terribly depleted natural fabric in our country. Um, so I, um, I think beavers are, um, they're almost the be all and end all. <laughs> very, very excited about the return of beavers to Britain. Mm. Yeah, so it is a, a good example watching beavers working and seeing a, a pair of beavers working together on, as you say, what they build is remarkable, isn't it? It seems out of scale to the size of, although they are substantial animals, it seems out of all scale to the, the impact they have on the, on the landscape. Um, well, the Native the Americans used to call them little people hmm. yeah, yeah, because yeah. of the fact that they were able to engineer their landscape in the way that people do. And because of a habit they have of leaving a shaft for ventilation at the top of their lodges. So they plaster the lodge with mud, but they leave a space at the top, which means on really cold weather, you see steam rising through the shaft at the center of the lodge. And it's on account of this that it's thought that, that the Native Americans called them little people. Oh, really? I didn't know that. That's great. I read that lovely book, Braiding Sweetgrass, um, recently. I don't know if you've read it by... Uh, I've got it. Yes, it's a fantastic book. And she talks about her, her um, ancestors, or not her ancestors, actually her immediate relatives, her grandmother and family, talking about the... Go, if you want to know something, go and ask the beaver people, or if you want to know something, go and ask the tree people, or and the way in which it was just a normal part of the landscape that you would go to find wisdom and understanding from another part of the natural world, whereas to us that's um, perceived or described as some kind of you know new age hippie rubbish, isn't it? Where in many cases it's just completely normal and what is expected that you would learn from people and also from from not people. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, and I think that that points to the way we're going to deliver ambitious nature restoration in the world and how we're going to solve some of these massive crises, which are all absolutely intertwined. You can't look at the climate crisis in isolation. You need to look at a whole breakdown of the biosphere as a result of a warped relationship that we have with it. Now, if, if, if one considers the overriding task of humanity to be the, well, to be the frictionless integration of our own human systems into natural ones, you know, and, and to achieve harmony with nature, then I think there are kind of two levels to the solution. Now, the first of those is economic. Now, we need to figure out what our healthy ecosystems worth 
Now, of course, they're intrinsically priceless, but at the same time, we need to write into our economic decision making what they are worth in economic terms. Now, a mangrove forest helps to protect communities from storm surges and flooding. It helps to keep the beaches pure and white, which underpins a tourism industry. It provides a nursery for young commercial fish. Um, it fulfills a whole bunch of ecological functions which carry an economic value. In the same way in the UK, um, of forested slopes help to mitigate flooding downstream. They help to mitigate drought whilst also storing carbon in the soil. There is a value to all of that. So I think a kind of cost benefit analysis whereby we write um, um, some kind of economic value on healthy ecosystems and the services they provide into our economic decision making is part of the answer. You know, that we, we have to do that, but it's only part of the answer. I, I think we also need to have a fundamental reset of our spiritual connection with nature. You know, Throughout the history of time, people have had at the center of their spiritual belief system um, a, a recognition of God in nature, as it were. And even the kind of monotheistic kind of religions that dominate in the world today, even they have their roots in, in, um, uh, uh, in, in, in the discovery of an eternal God in nature. And I think that we really need to reconnect. Or we need to help people to reconnect on this kind of a visceral belly level with nature um, and um, I think that that's not something which is absent in people I think it's dormant but not absent you know an apartment overlooking Hyde Park will sell for twice the price of one that doesn't you know people yearn for connection with nature go to any London park on a sunny day um, but I think that that needs translating into a more comprehensive and holistic kind of belly connection with the natural world if we're, if we're to end up in the right place um, and so this idea of learning from beavers or learning from the non-human world, I think, is absolutely central to that. Mm. Did you, talking of faith, did you hear that there's, um, there, I think there was an announcement today about a lot of, uh, a group of faith leaders, global faith leaders have come together to call for <coughs> the government to take specific action in order to enable COP to come out with some, to deliver, you know, to actually deliver on its promises. And what are your thoughts on that? It's interesting seeing as you, you mentioned the, the God word. Well, I think that is um, a spectacular development and long overdue. I'm, I'm not conventionally a religious person. You know, I was christened and confirmed as a, as, as a child, as a teenager, but I've never been a regular churchgoer. I'm not conventionally particularly religious. Um, and I think growing up, I think on one level or other, I considered the major religions to be complicit in the destruction of nature. You know, how, how is it that um, you know, a, a kind of God-fearing American Christian evangelical can run a business that blasts the coal out of Appalachian mountainsides and destroys kind of mountain streams and rivers and then goes to church on a Sunday and kind of says his prayers and, 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 and feels clean of conscience, you know, or, go, you know, go to Jeddah, which is one of the most holy places um, in, in, in just down the road from Mecca. It's, it's where you land if you go on the Hajj. And the sea is absolutely heaving with plastic and it is an environmental mess, really, Jeddah. Um, you know, and I think that, um, you know, I think that there's been some disconnection between what God is in the minds of billions of people and the natural world. Um, there's that wonderful philosopher, well, that wonderful quote by a philosopher called Hubert Reeve, who said, man is the craziest species who worships an invisible God while destroying a visible nature, not realizing that this nature he destroys is this God he worships. And so I think that the, the role of religion in solving this is absolutely critical. I've not heard that. It's really interesting, isn't it? And I was thinking the other day that of that vision of the blue planet, you know, that sphere image that came down with the, with the first astronauts and how just today I think the BBC are reporting a, a flyby of Mercury and how we are still excited by pushing out into other parts of our solar system with you know, with justification, because it is all part of an incredible, incredible universe. And um, as you say, leaving the oceans full of plastic here behind, it seems, it seems very, it seems like a, a huge imbalance between what we, 
what we aim to do and what we actually could do, because the things that we are, are facing at the moment, you know, the climate change threat and the way that we've sort of soiled our own patch, basically, they are still by the skin of our teeth um, mendable. And yet yeah. still, still we procrastinate. Yeah, I, 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 a lot of this space stuff for me, you know, of course, it's fascinating, but it's also, I think, a big distraction and, and in a way kind of hubristic. And what are we going to do? Are we really going to move humanity to live on some other planet? Mm -hmm. Look at the incredible gifts we've been given on this planet. Mm -hmm. I, um, I, I, so it doesn't appeal to me. I think it's unhelpful, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I, the beauty of fixing nature is that it really doesn't cost that much. And it's relatively easy to do. And the payback is often extraordinary. You, you, if, if, if you restore marine ecosystems, you witness a J-curve in the recovery of fish. You know, in, enormous numbers of fish proliferate in the few properly protected um, um, marine conservation zones around the world. The fishermen fishing around them outside of those zones are reporting hugely expanded catches. Mm -hmm. So the returns are there. It makes wonderful investment sense. And it's actually relatively inexpensive. You know, the power of nature is completely extraordinary. Now, I'm reading a book at the moment called Islands of Abandonment, which describes certain places in the world for historical reasons, which have been abandoned. Chernobyl, for example, mm. around the nuclear power disaster. Mm. And nature recovers incredibly quickly in these places. Imagine a city like Mumbai. I don't know if you, I've just be, been in Mumbai myself. And the power of the jungle would simply consume that city if we stopped what we're doing. So nature does have this immense visceral power to recover itself in all kinds of circumstances. We just need to give it space. And therefore, mending nature is not expensive in the big scheme of things, as compared with tackling COVID, you know, or, um, you know, or, or tackling the kind of housing crisis or all these other things, you know, brick by brick, machine by machine, building hospitals, all these things, they cost enormous sums of money. Restoring nature requires a tiny fraction of GDP to do it properly. And, and it's not getting that. You know, it's, it, in most places in the world, it's not getting that. But there are some countries, I think, which are starting to show the way. You know, Pakistan, for example, where my brother-in-law is prime minister, has its 10 billion tree tsunami. You know, that's hundreds of millions of dollars are being spent by coordinating huge numbers of volunteers in planting or, or uh, creating the conditions in which um, the natural regeneration of enormous numbers of trees will take place. And Pakistan is working towards the reintroduction of Asiatic rhinoceros for the first time in many, many decades. Um, Bhutan, Costa Rica, you know, there are a bunch of places that are doing really ambitious things. Um, and, um, you know, that, that's what we need to aspire to. You know, that's the kind of bar we need to set, especially as we're the hosts of COP here in the UK. And at the same time, we are among the most nature depleted nations on earth. You know, we really need to raise the bar of restoring nature here. We need to do it properly and show it can be done um, and, 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 and encourage the world to follow. Yes, I was um, interested very recently, there was a, a news article about um, the scientists who brought about the learning about the ozone layer um, that brought about eventually the Montreal Protocol and the, the sort of healing of the ozone layer. And I thought it was very interesting because it was a teamwork sort of between scientists, there were civil key civil servants involved in the US who really sort of made the change happen on the ground, you know, took the science and said, we need to change 350 different chemicals or whatever it was in our manufacturing processes and, and worked with industry on the ground. And then there were journalists and people who helped to sort of spread the word. And I kind of thought, you know, I'd be interested to know from your perspective, I know you're, you work as an, in an advisory capacity with government, whether you feel that we have that kind of delivery ability, do we have that urgency and that connection all the way through, you know, going from the information coming from the scientists through a sort of genuine active administration into, into the business world, because it, people have got to do this stuff haven't they at the other end and not rely on imaginary technology that may or may not happen in the future we, we've got to do it now not not 2040 we have to we have to do it in the next five ten years i mean i'm a natural optimist and 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 i'm actually more optimistic than i've ever been that, that 
not just in this country, but everywhere, um, nature and climate are you know, moving very fast to the top of the agenda and that people are serious about acting. I mean, in this country, I, you know, I remember years of, of kind of a token one million pounds for tree planting in the north in kind of one budget after the next under Blair and then under Cameron. And, and, and now we have the 640 million pounds of nature for climate funding. You know, announced last February. And that's an enormous slug of money directly aimed at restoring nature in Britain. That money is now finding its way down to projects on the ground. The replacement of common agricultural policy farm subsidies with a new system that they call public money for public good. Well, that will be billions of pounds each year being spent directly on the land, helping farmers to restore nature. And 75% of our land is farmed. Um, so that's another enormous win for, for the natural world in Britain. The Environment Bill, I think, is really exciting, runs to kind of several hundred pages. Now, it's obviously not perfect, but once passed, that will be one of the most comprehensive, ambitious environmental law frameworks of any country in the world. So I, I, I feel like here in the UK, things are really happening. I think we have a government that genuinely wants to raise raise its game on this stuff certainly it's the greenest government we've ever had but that's not saying much because no government previously has been particularly hands-on in its approach to, to restoring nature and tackling the climate crisis but there, there are good things happening and um there are a lot of people out there striving to figure out what works best and there are new collaborations that are springing up all over the place um i mean one one example you know, we, we talked about business, is the, is the example of Wessex Water in the south of England at Poole, now making payments on an annual basis to several hundred farmers in that catchment to protect it, to, to reduce nitrates and phosphates that are running off into the water and to protect sensitive parts of the catchment to help reduce flooding and so on. That's a private market arrangement between a water company and a bunch of private landowners. Um, th those are now cropping up all over Britain. So this, this kind of collaboration between business, farmers and government, I think is, um, it's sort of happening. You know, I, I really feel like things are happening. Um, but do we have all the answers yet? No. And is the ambitious, ambition high enough? No. Um, but um, there's people like you and me to kind of um, to hustle and harangue people as much as we can. And I think everyone should join an environment group very few people one or two percent of the country are members of an environment group the most useful thing someone can do is give five pounds a month or ten pounds a month whatever they can afford to to greenpeace or the beaver trust or friends of the earth or the sea shepherd or one of these organizations because um you know more strength to their elbow i wonder you talking about you know landowners and government uh, working together and then wondering what the role is for sort of bringing using the rest of the resources we have you know, the, the huge numbers of ordinary people we have who you know might want to participate I, i'd be interested to know what you think about separate from sort of party politics systems where people are involved given good information and then seem to make quite good decisions on the back of it so for instance the i don't know if you've taken part in ever something like a citizens assembly or a people's assembly where you the concept is a bit like a giant jury system where you have uh, a group of regular folk taken by some kind of um, lot, but uh, representative of, of any given society. And then you pose the question to them and they have access to a very wide range of high quality information, which they use in order to discuss and then come and then deliberate on and come to a conclusion. And I think they used it successfully in Ireland to decide a question for um, the referendum on whether to change the laws on abortion. I found that very interesting because it was a very divisive issue and they managed to come to an to a conclusion that was informed and and very interesting and perhaps not not what was expected. And I wonder whether we've sort of, you know, have we missed a trick somehow in you know, true collaboration, I feel, should be involving a, a lot more of us somehow. Yeah, <clears throat> I completely agree. I mean, I've, on, on a national level, Switzerland and some of the, the some of the American states have a system whereby the, the people take a direct decision on things. So Colorado, for example, recently voted to reintroduce wolves. Switzerland has voted as a nation on a bunch of environmental issues and the results nearly always go the right way 
Um, so I, um, I think that involving people in the form of citizens assemblies and local, regional or national plebiscites, I think is really, really good way to raise the bar and, and, and get things to happen, which perhaps democratically elected politicians and, and their officials might be a bit slower to enact. Um, I, I also like some of these grassroots movements, for example, the farmers markets movement has been really important in, 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 in invigorating the local food economy in Britain. Now, there were next to no farmers markets in the UK 20 or 30 years ago, and now they're everywhere. Um, the transition town movement where um, volunteers come out in places like Totnes or Froome and they plant community orchards and prepare community vegetable gardens and across the Atlantic in the US, places like Detroit now have this community food production activity, which is very organized and um, people give their time. And, um, and, and I think they benefit physically and spiritually from participating in it. Um, and of course it provides food for, for, for um, um, uh, deprived communities. So I, um, yeah, I think, um, I think involving people in all these kind of ways is really valuable. And I think the role of government is to provide seed corn, seed corn support for these kinds of initiatives. And I'd, I'd love to see um, the, the, the government more actively supportive of the farmers markets or of the transition towns movement. Um, and I'd love to see citizens kind of climate and nature recovery committees popping up or assemblies all over the UK rather than just in those avant-garde places where they exist now like Brighton or Bristol. Yeah, absolutely. I think people need to get involved. Everyone needs to get involved. I mean, I, I, I mentioned that I was just recently in Mumbai. I went, one of my children underwent a medical procedure there with a with a world expert, and that happened to be the place where um where 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 where, where we needed to go, and, and and we were lucky enough to get a visa to go. And while we were there, we participated in a voluntary litter cleanup with an amazing guy called Afroz Shah. Now, anyone listening to this, I really encourage you to Google Afroz Shah. Afroz is um, uh, uh, grew up in the slums of Mumbai, Muslim became a successful lawyer and in his early 30s decided that he would instead devote himself to cleaning up his area. And he started alone, um, literally picking up plastic on Versova Beach um, himself. And it was an impossible task, it was a sort of Sisyphean task, you know, six meters of plastic piled up high all the way to the water's edge along a beach that's three kilometers long. No way he could do that on his own. But people started to join him. They just saw him working and doing it, and they joined him eventually in their thousands. And even very famous people, Amitabh Bakchan, the most famous actor in India, rubber gloves on, picking up plastic with Afros Shah. Well, that beach is now spotless. Indeed, a turtle nested on that beach for the first time in anyone's memory last year. Um, I, I, I joined him, and now he's cleaning up the mangroves behind the beach and the, 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 the streams that, which flow from the hills out towards the sea. Um, and that the movement has caught on. It's got a kind of Gandhian momentum about it. And there are now cleanup movements across India and the Afros Shah Foundation has become something very, very serious. And he's speaking and traveling all over India. And, but he's a very humble guy. And, and we need Afros Shah type community leaders in every community in the world. We need people like him cleaning up litter, persuading people to recycle and not to create waste, persuading people not to, um, um, to, to, to harm the nature around them, but to restore it. Um, and I, I was just blown, blown away by my time with Afros. And um, I think we're um, pretty much up for time, but I've, I've really enjoyed um, our conversation, Ben, and hope people go away and look up some of the uh, things that you mentioned. Oh, Nikki, thank you so much. I feel very grateful that you asked me and um, I hope we'll, having spoken lots, I hope we will meet in person soon. Brilliant, thanks very much. Perhaps we'll, perhaps we'll go and see a beaver wetland together. Oh yes, that would be good. All right, thank you, Nick. Thanks.